Welcome back to the Fertility Clinic. The year is now 2035. Now, the last time you were here, about 10 years ago, you went through the IVF and embryo screening process to ensure that your daughter would not be born with a terrible, life-altering, single-gene mutation disease. Now, your daughter is 10 years old, living very healthy, giving you notable confidence in the role embryo screening can play in enhancing a child's health. On the other hand, you remember picking your child up from school and seeing several other students with genetic abnormalities that could have been avoided had these parents chose to conceive in a lab rather than sexual intercourse. Now, it is 2035 and you're back at the same fertility clinic you visited 10 years ago. Doctor, it's really great to see you again. I've had such a great experience with IVF and embryo selection that I'd like to do it again. The doctor smiles. <laughs> well, that's what everybody says. Can I offer you a cappuccino? That seems peculiar, you think to yourself. Assisted reproduction has become a more competitive customer service business over the past 10 years as it's grown in popularity. The doctor hands you a cappuccino. You know, you were well ahead of your time a decade ago when you decided to have us fertilize 10 of your eggs. You sip your cappuccino. Yeah, I mean, I've been sleeping a bit easier over the past year since I knew that the other nine embryos were still frozen. These past couple of years, I've came to the conclusion that I really do want another child. The doctor responds. All right, so here's what I suggest. Let's thaw out six of your remaining nine embryos, then extract five cells from each for pre-implantation genetic testing, just like we did last time. Sure, you say confidently. The doctor continues, but a lot has changed since your last visit here 10 years ago. Back then, we could only screen for single gene mutation disorders and a couple of very simple traits such as hair and eye color. Over the past decade, we've learned a lot more about the patterns of multiple genes that lead to more complex genetic disorders, some of which may not even show up until later in life. Now, because these patterns vary from person to person, and since we don't fully understand the hugely complex whole genome, we can only see this kind of analysis as directionally predictive. We're no longer just dealing with binary outcomes, the on and off switch for single gene mutation disorders we talked about a decade ago. We'll just be able to make percentage predictions. Like for instance, there is a 70% chance a child born from one embryo, for example, would get disease X before he or she is Y years old. It wouldn't mean that the potential child would definitely get that disease, just that someone with those genetics would have the higher chances of getting it. Of course, this wouldn't account for environmental factors a child would encounter after they are born. Does this all make sense to you? Yes, you say. The doctor continues. But we are able to make these kinds of predictions for many of the most serious and painful diseases that are influenced by genetics. The onset familia, Alzheimer's, heart disease, some cancers, etc. While you can't completely avoid all those diseases through embryo selection, you can certainly improve the odds of your future child by delaying or avoiding them. Wow, a lot really has changed, you say. The doctor continues. Now, I'm required by law to ask if you want this predictive information. You, of course, have the right to refuse it. If you want the information, you'll just have to sign on this tablet right here with the stylus. So, you pick up the stylus and you sign. Why wouldn't you want the information at the end of the day? You have to choose one of the embryos to implant anyway. Why not pick the one with the greatest chance to live a healthy life? Then the doctor continues. The law also requires me to ask you specifically if you would like to know more about the likelihood that your embryos, if they are implanted and taken to term, would express other non-disease related traits. That's completely up to you, of course. Your spine stiffens as you begin to understand, but you still ask, what kinds of traits exactly do you mean? Well, some of the most popular are patterns of genes suggesting a greater chance to live a long, healthier life. Well, that seems like a no-brainer, you reply relieved. Of course, isn't that the whole reason why you're doing all this? To ensure that your child has a good chance of living a healthy life? The doctor continues, Some people get nervous the further we go from preventing disease. So many diseases are correlated with age, so if we want to fight the disease, we also need to defend our children against aging. Some of those other people think doctors like you are playing God, you say. The doctor smiles wistfully at the suggestion. Some people certainly feel that assisted reproduction is going too far, that we're giving people choices that nature or whatever deity they trust didn't want us humans to have. That's why it's so important to find out what each parent is comfortable with. You tell us what works for you so we can help you achieve it. You continue. 
I would have had a lot more qualms when I came in a decade ago, but now I see not selecting the embryos with the greatest chance of long-term and healthy life is like taking something away from your future child. It, it doesn't feel like I'm adding healthy years to his or her life by preventing them from being taken away. You again lift the stylus to sign. The doctor gives a hand signal for you to wait. Longevity is just one of the genetic screens. We also very accurately predict height. Should I go on? Well, I read that tall people have higher incomes and tend to have more self-esteem than short people. Most of the studies do suggest that, the doctor replies. Do a couple of inches of height mean so much to you that you'd choose a different embryo to get it? But then all these embryos are your potential ch natural children anyway, so why not pick a taller one if all things are equal anyway? Picking a taller future child, you explain to yourself, is the same as not picking a shorter one. You take a deep breath. Ugh, why not? What's the big deal? I'm already selecting for so many other things. The stylus is feeling heavier as you lift it. The doctor again raises her hand. The next screen is... IQ. You've seen the news articles, but something still feels uncomfortable about choosing the potential IQ of your future child. You respond. How accurate is the test? You ask, stalling for time. Can we really know something like that? It's all probabilities, but we're getting better at making these kinds of predictions. IQ isn't all about genetics. How you raise and educate your child still means a lot, but IQ is mostly a genetic characteristic, particularly as we age. But will my child be happier if he or she has a higher IQ? No one really knows, the doctor says. The whole concept is still controversial. Many people say IQ is culturally biased, but society itself may be culturally biased too, so I'm not sure where that leaves us. And there's no denying the correlation between IQ and lots of other important life outcomes. You take a deep inhale again. Do you really want to be in the business of choosing your future child's brain function? You ask yourself, if you don't optimize your child for IQ, will she love you or hate you for it? Repeated studies from around the world have shown that people with higher IQs tend to live longer on average than people with lower IQs, she adds. How do you come to that, you ask? Lots of ways. The Scottish government gave IQ tests to all 11-year-olds in Scotland on a single day in the 1930s. Six decades later, researchers began correlating the IQs from to those children's life experiences, even when they controlled for social class and a lot of other factors. The outcomes still showed that the higher IQ kids on average lived longer. Scores of additional studies have shown the same thing. But IQ isn't just one thing, how could they really know, you ask? Not wanting to reduce the identity of your future child to survey results. You are right, IQ is a complicated concept many people reject. Some people even say a high IQ doesn't even make you smart. And if someone has a high IQ, does that make them a better artist, more loyal friend, more uh, loving parent, you ask? Those are all the right questions. The answer to all of them is no. There's no evidence of any of that, but there's a lot of statistical research suggesting that high IQs strongly correlates with success in school, career, wealth creation, and social ability. You feel yourself relenting in spite of yourself. You know IQ doesn't measure everything and that a human is so much more than a simple IQ score, but are you prepared to reject the concept of IQ out of hand and leave it to your future child to suffer the consequences if you are wrong? That would also be a risk. If you don't select the embryo with the highest IQ, it's not at all certain that the embryo you select will have greater genetic predisposition to being a better artist or more compassionate person. For all you know, those qualities might, like so much else, also be positively correlated with IQ. You really don't know. But a twinge in your gut also tells you there's something wrong. Not about choosing an embryo with relatively higher IQ than the others, but not choosing your higher IQ embryo. This is not the most politically correct thought you've ever had, but now you realize is a moment for brutal honesty. You squeeze the stylus between your fingers, and you look up. There's more, the doctor continues, a grave look crossing her face. I need to tell you about some of the latest research and personality styles. Personality styles, you repeat? A lump forming in your throat now? What is left for the mystery of a human being? I imagine you know people in your life who are more extroverted than others. Oh yeah, you say, thinking of your sister. And people who are more open or more neurotic, or even people who are sadistic and cruel. Personality styles have many foundations, the doctor continues, but genetics is probably the biggest. Wait a second, you say, feeling another tug at humanity. You're telling me I could select which of these little embryos in your freezer is going to be the next Mother Teresa and which is the next Jeffrey Dahmer? The doctor can't seem to decide if you're joking, but plays things cautiously. She walks over and sits you on the chair beside you. 
What I'm saying, she says softly, is that we're beginning to understand the genetic patterns underlying different personality styles. And people who want that information when selecting which of their embryos to implant are entitled to it by law, provided they sign a waiver before getting that information. A person's personality comes from so many different sources, you say, still trying to hold on to the magical unknown of being human. How can you reduce all that to genetics? We can't, the doctor replies. Full stop. She pauses a moment to let her point settle. But we can offer statistical probabilities. If you choose to do so, you could have the ability to select the embryo from among your six that has the highest statistical likelihood relative to the others of having whichever personality style you choose. Something doesn't seem right about that, you say. It feels like I'd be ordering my child from Starbucks, almost. Light on the milk, extra shot of espresso, three pumps of mocha. Look, I'm not here to convince you one way or another, she says, leaning back. I'm just explaining your options. It's really up to you. Now your mind's racing. You think back to your own childhood, how surprised your parents were that you were great at math when neither of them could balance out a checkbook. You remember how proud you felt overcoming shyness to sing in your school talent show. You remember all the unknown mysteries that unraveled over the course of your life. Would you have felt the same if your parents had selected options for you off of a menu? Would they have been as happy when you sang in the talent show or just knowing you would do it because you had already been genetically optimized for extroversion? But then again, you counter in your head, all these embryos are my natural children anyway. One of them will be born into the world where other parents are making these same exact decisions. If I'm going to invest in the coming decades of my life in helping my future child flourish in every way, why wouldn't I pick the embryo with the best shot? You feel your arm quivering, your hand inadvertently squeezes the stylus even harder. To sign or not to sign, that is the question. Now, while what I read to you was, of course, a hypothetical scenario from the book Hacking Darwin by Jamie Metzl, this is certainly not far off from the potential reality you and I will have the option of facing in the not-too-distant future. You see, we've already made extreme progress in this field. In fact, it used to cost millions of dollars to have a single person's DNA sequenced, but now it costs just a few hundred dollars, and in a few years, might cost as little as $80. The more people who end up having their DNA sequenced, along with their permission to compare them to their actual physical and mental traits, the more we could begin to determine far more than just single gene mutation diseases or traits such as eye and hair color. In other words, it's really only a matter of time until this becomes reality. Multi-gene patterns will become more and more clear as more people have their DNA sequenced. It's just a matter of how much data is available. And so with that I ask you, if you were given these options, would you choose to receive all this information? Please share your notions regarding this down in the comments below and perhaps even describe what traits you would prioritize such as height, IQ, etc. Lastly, subscribe and enable post notifications for more thought-provoking videos like this. Perhaps even share this with a friend. This way, you can see if they disagree with you or even agree with you. Anyway, have a nice day.